Right, good morning and a, a great big welcome to Croydon University Centre. I'm Mimi, I'm the head of um, higher education here at Croydon University Centre. Um, I'm going to start off this day by um, just giving you a brief, quick overview of Croydon University Centre, what we offer our students and the facilities we've got here, um, and why students come to us. And then I'm going to hand you over to our esteemed programme leader, Lucia Gutierian, who leads the Criminology, Psychology and Social Justice Programme. And we've also got some of our final year degree students here with us um, who will be able to kind of give you a little bit of an update and an overview of um, how they've found Croydon University Centre and their journey with us. And they're all seen going to be graduating this year, so it's all very exciting year for, for them. So sit back, relax, and plenty of opportunity for you to ask questions. And um, towards the end, there's also a Q&A box at the bottom. If you can see that, you can pop some questions in there, or you can um, ask some questions in the chat. But we will do, at um, several touch points, um, open up for questioning. Um, so Croydon University Centre, Brilliant. I'm just, there we go. Um, so on this slide there, I've just kind of highlighted five, five top reasons why students choose our university centre and why they come to us. Obviously, these are not exclusive reasons, um, but it's what, what we found attractive people to, to our centre. We're very accessible. Um, we're in the heart of Croydon with about five minutes stroll towards East Croydon Rail and Tram Station. Um, and we offer a wide range of different courses. I know you're here to find out about the criminology course, um, but you know we, we offer undergraduate degrees um, and also high national certificates, and we also do teacher training courses. Then our tuition fees, we're very proud that we were, we're able to freeze our undergraduate tuition fees at £6,000 for this coming year. Um, it's some of the lowest tuition fees that you will find in and around London. So we're very pleased that we were able to put on top quality courses at a low and affordable price. Then all of our courses are quality assured by external agencies. Our undergraduate degree courses are being validated by the University of Roehampton from next year, which is one of the top 10 universities in London. Our other programmes are also being um, validated by Pearson's and City and Guild. So you've always got that rubber stamp behind behind your degree being delivered at Croydon University Centre. Um, then student support. We offer students a wraparound student support programme, which is improving every, every year on year. We offer a supportive, inclus inclusive teaching environment and our lecturers are subject experts and many of them have years of industry experience. So in a nutshell, the top five reasons why people choose, choose us. Then just about a little bit about teaching and learning that you'll experience at Croydon University Centre. Um, we've experienced lecturers and academics and they're subject experts, like I've just said, um, with a lot of that industry experience that they bring into the classroom setting. Um, you can expect to have your courses delivered through a mix of learning environments, both face to face, and we'll be keeping an element of online learning come September. We were um, you know, like many universities, we had to react really quickly last year in the face of the pandemic and move our learning online. Our um, online platforms have improved no end um, over the course of this year to make it more accessible for our students, more interactive for our students. So we will be keeping a small element of online learning in future courses. So do just ask if you want to know more about that as well. Um, then we offer students academic um, progress supports throughout their studies. And each year a student is being assigned a personal academic tutor. Um, we try and keep the same tutors throughout your course. Uh, and this person will sit down with you um, throughout various touch points and go through your academic progress. And if you need to, they'll set up action plans for you and set smart targets for you, how to achieve your successful outcomes and how to complete your assignments. Um, then we're not like a big university, we're a, a small unique centre where we offer inclusive teaching in smaller cohort groups. So we often have 10 um, student groups of 10 to 15 to 20, sometimes it goes up to 30, but probably no more than 30. So that just gives you that individualised approach as well. And then you can expect um, your, assess, you, your um, learning outcomes to be assessed through a range of different assessment methods. Do ask the course tutors or, um, in fact, the chair here today about, you know, how your course will be assessed. 
Um, so there's no surprise, surprises down the road. You know, sometimes there is an asset, um, examination that you need to do. Um, most of it, there'll be a literature review that you need to do and also some research. So do just, just ask to find out more about that. Um, then I briefly want to touch as well on um, student life because it's not just all about studying as much as we want it to be. Um, our university centre is located within our main campus in Croydon College. Um, we're on the third floor and we have a selection of classrooms, lecture theatres, PVC labs and quiet study spaces for our university centre students. Um, when you join us, you'll have access to um, our virtual learning in environment called Moodle, where you can find all your course and module resources. You'll also have access to our um, online library. Then we have a learning resource centre um, in our main campus. It's spread over three floors. And the third floor is generally reserved for um, a quiet study space for our um, university centre students. You'll also find a dedicated subject librarian for your course, which are, who is available on a different floor in the library, who will be able to help you with um, finding journals and um, books, etc. Um, the library is also open for extended hours during some of the weekdays. Um, these change, but generally it's on a Tuesday, Wednesday and a Thursday. Um, so, you know, after you've finished your classes, you can stay a bit longer and work in the, in the library. And then um, for our university centre students, they also have a dedicated HE common room where it's got a little kitchenette where you can warm up your food and make your coffees and teas and just um, sit and relax with your fellow students. And as I mentioned in the beginning, we're very close to... Um, to the main rail station and we've got a rows and rows of cafes and restaurants and bars and box parks so if you're you know looking to the socialization side you know you can always meet up with your friends um just across the road as well which makes it uh, just a really nice rounded student experience um on your screen now is just the other courses that we offer here as well we've got three year full-time um, degree programs on the subjects listed there on your screen we also offer higher national certificates and diplomas in construction engineering business and management as well as a teacher training course um, i know you're here to find out more about um, cpsj as we like to call the criminology psychology and social justice course um, and then i just like to mention that we have um, a very well supported student support services department here who's um, who can give you guidance on well-being safeguarding additional learning support if there are any of you who have a learning difficulty or a disability please don't worry just do get in touch with us or our additional learning support team because we will be able to meet with you and set up a reasonable adjustment plan um, to afford you some um, exam access arrangements um, so do get in touch. Um, if you weren't able to attend one of our support sessions earlier this week, um, do send us an email and we can put you in touch with the right person. We also have a finance department and every second Friday there's a drop-in session with a member of the finance team who will be able to give you advice and guidance on student loans, um, on payment plans and just general advice and guidance on, on student finance. And they're very happy to discuss any of your needs with you. Um, and then that was very much in a nutshell, a very quick overview from me. I will now pass over to um, Lucia, who is our program leader here today. Hi, Lucia. Hello. Hi. I'm just going to share my screen first. Um, right. Okay. Are we? Seeing this? Cool. Yes, Lucia, thank you. Right. So, just one second, guys. Okay, so my name is Lucia Gicherian. I am the program leader of the BA uh, in uh, Criminology, Psychology, and Social Justice. Uh, just a little bit about what you will study on this degree. We, are, we have three uh, this, this is a multidisciplinary degree that connects, that joins together uh, criminology, psychology, and social justice so that students don't have to think in the first year what they want to become when they graduate. So you can take your first year to settle in, to find out about the, uh, the different disciplines, and then you can, you can decide which, uh, how, which direction you want to go. So the degree examines deeply the reasons for crime in, and injustice in society and around the world. In the first year, you start with, uh, with um, local uh, 
local um, uh, understandings of crime and society, and the, uh, and uh, we will look at. Uh, minor crimes. So we will look at uh, um, by the time by the time you get into your third year, we will look at um, uh, crimes that crimes against uh, humanity and international crimes, wars, terrorism, and so on. Uh, we will also look at crimes of the powerful uh, in the second year and and gangs and so on. Um, to do this. Uh, we also explore topics such as uh, human interaction and behavior, crime, deviance, and the criminal justice system, uh, societal inequality, injustices, culture, social institutions, and power relations, and transnationality and society. So the program is mainly about crime, but it is also about the sociology of crime. It is also about the psychology of crime. Yeah, so 60% of the program is focused on criminology and then the other 40% on um, social justice and so sociology and um, uh, psychology. Now, what you will leave with, you will leave with the ability to apply theories to practical aspects of life and work. You will leave with uh, um, skills of critical thinking and critical analytic skills, which are very much sought after transferable job skills at the moment. So employers want to want uh, graduates uh, that they that uh, that are that they employ to have these soft skills. So you will be trained in critical thinking and critical analytical skills, problem solving, negotiation, communication skills, and so on. Uh, you will have a better understanding of problems in society, equality, inequality, injustices, discrimination. Uh, you will have cultural and historical context of, of uh, problems that, ha that, that are part of our society. Not just the society that we are living here in London, in England, for example, because we are because of globalization and because of the shrinking of the world. So we will look at culture and historical context of, of uh, um, important things that have shaped the world that we are living in now. When you leave, by the time you leave, you will be able to do all these things. And But additionally, um, you will be able to do two things. You can either go to, to an employment, you know, you can, you can find a job with your degree and go, to, um, uh, go into employment. Um, and in the second year, we, will, we have a volunteering module which will um, with with uh, in which we will guide you and try to help you to find jobs, um, or you can. The second option is to continue your education at master's level. Uh, some students have even gone on to do their PhDs from when, when they graduated from us. Many many students uh, usually end up doing their masters um, in very in, in excellent uh, universities. Some of the areas of employment, some of the career pathways that you can choose after this degree is that you can become a police officer, you can become a crime, a crime a criminal profiler, a counseling psychologist, you can become an, a government advisor, prison officer, forensic psychologist, you can go into forensic science, uh, you can become a teacher, a mental health worker. So there are many, this is not, this is not an exclusive uh, uh, list of um, areas. Because it is a multidisciplinary um, program and because because you get you 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 get to know um, a lot of different things. So so this degree opens a lot of doors for you in the area of employment and also for um, further um, um, postgraduate um, studies. So this is some of the uh, testimonies that our students have said about us. Uh, so they like how they are able to find that what they were interested in, especially because the degree is like it's it's because it's got three disciplines. So the students were happy that they didn't have to concentrate on find on knowing at the beginning what they want to become at the end. Uh, they like small classes. Uh, we have uh, quite small classes. Uh, numbers are maximum uh, 25 people in a class, but it's it's rarely that. So we have a year three, for example, right now, which is co which consists of 10 people. 
uh, we have year one, which consists of another, again, 10 people. So we have personalized interaction with our students in order to help them to achieve uh, their um, potential. They liked that they didn't have to go all the way to Sussex because we were we were validated by Sussex before this. Like next year, we will be we are we have now been validated by Roehampton. But up until next last year or this year, we were validated by Sussex University. So they liked the idea that they didn't have to go all the way to Sussex, but they still got a Sussex degree, and they saved nine thousand pounds by doing uh, their degree in uh, in Croydon. Uh, so this is Mimi talked about this already. We we are we've managed to freeze our fees uh, in order to uh, so that students are not um, you know inundated with debt even before they start their um, uh, their employment. They liked how they could experience. I like this bit here. Uh, they like uh, they experience mundane things without becoming uh, without being becoming bankrupt. And they liked how they could apply a lot of the program to things outside of uni. Um, we have an opportunity now uh, with our three fantastic, excellent uh, final, final year students uh, where you can ask them questions about the degree and their uh, their experience before I before I go on to do a little uh, taster lecture about serial killers and what motivates serial killers and theoretical explanations about serial killers. So um, is it Ike who's going to start first? I'm going to stop sharing now. I will come back to this uh, just to give an opportunity for you to ask uh, to ask your questions. Oh, okay. Thank you very much, Lucia. Thank you. Um, hi, guys. My name is Aik Onwuka. I am a final year student of what we call CPSJ. That's Criminology, Psychology, and Social Justice. Um, I came into the university via the access to higher education. So this should be my fourth year in Croydon. So... Uh, <laughs> When I saw my name today as staff, I'm, I felt like, okay, I think I'm a staff as well. <laughs> anyway, um, my experience in the course, I don't know, I don't have enough words to describe my experience or how I feel, but I think I have to borrow from what um, Lucia just said, what you will leave with. Number one, she said the, the ability to apply theories to practical aspects of life and work. This is true. In my own case, from when you get to study uh, criminology, you will learn so many theories about so many things. The way we live, let me give you guys an example. You see, when we do primary school, secondary school, colleges, these things have been tried in the past for, for centuries. There are so many theories that, that guide the curriculum that you see now. The levels of skills, you study something like um, uh, development of childhood, you will find out theories of so many people who has gotten up to where the society is today. And then critical thinking is one thing that she said. How you analyze different things in life, in your work, in your personal life, in your business. When you get to study criminology or CPSJ in general, this is what this course is all about. For me, I see critical thinking as back and forth, advantage and disadvantage, what's, what works and what doesn't work. That's the way I see critical thinking. And so far, it has helped me to improve in my work in school. And then also communication skills. The way I speak today, honestly, that's not the way I used, I was speaking three years ago. I was very shy. I couldn't hold the conversation. I mean, I, I, I could talk to a girl, but not to talk to people like this. I wasn't this, I, I'm not saying I'm good, but I'm better now. And I got to learn this because of the kind of interaction you have in class. We don't have a big class, like Lucia said, we have 20, 20 10 people. So it's like Taylor made for you you get to ask all sorts of questions whether they mean anything or not so this interaction kind of built you up to become a good speaker you can communicate well and then we have the student services 
that you can just walk in and then get stuff done. You, I don't know about other universities. I, I attended a um, higher, higher institution in Nigeria before I came to Europe, but I didn't have all this kind of, all this kind of benefits. And finally, one good thing, I don't know where you guys live. One good thing that made me to come to Korean College was where it was in the center of Croydon, because I live in Surrey, so it takes me 15 minutes to get there. And the time that the lecture starts is, is perfect for someone that has two kids. Uh, so I, I do business. So it, it works for me. It doesn't affect my work. It doesn't affect me picking up my kids when they close by 3.30, sorry. So it was just perfect. Most people didn't even know that I'm in uni because it didn't disrupt any of my activities. So people are beginning to find out that I'm in uni because of the way my life changed, the way I carry myself changed. They started thinking, what's going on? And I told them, oh, I've been in university all this while. So this is my personal experience. I could go on, but I'm just going to wish you guys well if you join the course. And I hope I'll see you guys somewhere, somehow in the field of criminology. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you so much for that, Arg. It's, it's always lovely to hear from our students. I don't know if uh, Charlene or Max um, want to add anything to that. And if there's any questions, please do pop them in the Q&A at the bottom. I've got Charlene here with me. Charlene, hi. Hi. Hi, guys. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Charlene. Um, like, I come on the third year of CPSJ. Um, when I first came to uh, CUC, I was actually meant to study law. I ended up on CPSJ. Um, I come from a legal background, um, but I had like 15 years experience working in legal departments and stuff. So I wanted to do a law degree, but I ended up doing CPSJ. And I have to be honest with you, I think it was the best thing I ever did. I don't regret doing CPSJ at all. Um, you don't get bored on the course. I've never been bored. Even if it's not a subject that I'm really interested in, I get engaged into the lesson. Um, Lucia is a fantastic lecturer. Um, the other lecturers are fantastic. Uh, you learn uh, such a varied uh, multitude of subjects across the disciplines. It's just amazing. Um, accessibility, you can't go wrong. It's just literally a two minutes walk from the station, East Croydon. Um, it takes me literally 10 minutes to get into uni. But what I have to say about the course is the way that when we got hit with the COVID um, pandemic last year and we got hit really bad, it didn't impact our studies. Um, the course was resilient. Um, we were still having online lectures. We were still doing group work. We were still doing our presentations online. Accessibility to your lecturers. You could book your appointments online and have face-to-face -face um, appointments on Teams or Zoom. So yeah, um, I would definitely recommend this course for anybody that's interested in social justice, psychology, criminology. Um, I mean, three years later, I've come out of this, well, God willing, 28th of May. Um, I believe in this course on the 28th of May. And I just changed my whole way of thinking about everything, even in the supermarket, honestly. Um, so yeah, I would definitely recommend giving the course a go and wish everybody luck. Thank you very much. Brilliant, Charlene, thank you very much for that. I don't know how you walk across the road in two minutes. It takes me at least five to seven minutes, but yes, it is close, like you said. And it is very interesting to hear as well um, how our students come from you know, such different backgrounds as well. Um, you know, and just thinking that Charlene was really set on doing law. Uh, she's got that years and years of um, experience within the law background and found this course really beneficial to her. And similarly to Mike, who's, you know, um, got his own business as well and just how it's enriched their own personal development. Um, we've got another student here, Max. Um, Max, I don't know if you want to contribute anything. Uh, yes. Uh, so I'm saying Max James. I uh, say my experience with this course um, and the university in whole, uh, quite extremely similar and the same as my fellow two colleagues. Um, I've came straight from, funny enough, from Croydon College, so from the same institution. 
from uh, a level three public service uniform course. So in, in total, I've been in this institution for about six years now, and this will be my sixth and final year. Um, and uh, I've, I've uh, done quite, uh, say I've done quite a lot in, in this time, uh, growing, developing, and uh, understanding a variety of subjects. And as, as, as everything has been covered, it is a very unique uh, class and course. The, um, the understanding of it is, is quite interesting in, in many regards because uh, the people who join the course with you tend to be people similar to you in the aspect of wanting to learn, wanting to understand and wanting to develop. So you end up making a close knit of uh, understanding and, and, and beliefs and, it, and it's, it's very helpful and uh, gratifying uh, being able to develop and learn and, and feel safe developing in front of people you've just met but you grow with throughout the um, three years of this course. Um, I myself uh, have, let's say, autism, dyslexia and dyscalculia. I would say dyscalculia, I apologise. Um, and say so I've not been the most academic, but I've still managed to get a very good grades and everything with the help and support of Lucia and the fellow staff members, along with, um, let's say, the rest of the university. Um, but yeah, this course is extremely beneficial because I never knew what I obviously wanted to do leaving college but joining this uh, course it helps control your mindset and help you sort of concentrate on growing yourself but then understanding what uh, aspects are uh, but yes yeah, so I it is very uh, interesting course and I hope as I Ike said um, that you choose this university but also choose this course specifically as it is a great opportunity um, no matter what, uh, but yeah, sorry, thank you. Max, thank you so much for, for your honest sharing there. And, um, you know, it's, it's good to hear as well that you guys, you know, form that close knit bond because your, your cohort specifically has, has gone three years now together um, in classes and online classes. And, you know, I, I think it's probably one of the best supported cohorts we have here at the university center. You've also got your own, um, Criminology Society, which often debates and have guest speakers, which is another, you know, plus point. And you've all become such good public speakers. Um, if I'm sure you can all kind of think back to when you were first year, like I said as well, you know, that just that now that confidence you have just to stand up in front of a group of people going, you know, this is my opinion and I'm, I have a valid opinion. Thank you so much to our students here today. If there's no questions from the audience, um, then thank you again for sharing your honest and um, you know opinions of how you found the course and where your different journeys, how you ended up here. We obviously wish you a lot of luck for graduating quite soon and we'll all hopefully be able to celebrate in style soon. I'm going to now hand over back to Lucia um, to give us a little uh, mini lecture on serial killers. So this should be an interesting one. So sit back, relax and enjoy people. Thank you very much. Okay, guys, so I'm going to start my lecture. First, I'm going to share the screen. So this is where we were last, the last screen, the last time. Uh, okay, so okay. this lecture is about serial killers. I will provide definition uh, of what is a serial killer, motivations of serial killers, what makes serial killers kill, uh, why are they so difficult to spot, why do they kill? <clears throat> and then we are going to look at some theoretical explanations. I hope you enjoy the, uh, the lecture and I will take questions at the end if you have them. Uh, right. First of all, uh, throughout history, the phenomenon of serial murder has been studied by using biological, psychological and sociological explanations. You have uh, you have not just serial killers, multiple, multiple murderers involve different kinds of killers. So you have uh, mass murderers who kill four people at one location, four or more people at one location. These include things like genocide as well. You have spree killers who kill more than two people uh, in one location, in more than one location, sorry, 
uh, and although their murders occur in separate locations, but their spree, which is the sustained period of unrestrained killing, is considered as a single event. But you also have serial killers. Serial killers kill three or more victims uh, in different locations, so in separate, on separate occasions in different locations. They are usually, they usually select their victims very carefully. After the kill, they have a cooling off period and they plan their next murder very carefully. Some serial killers travel widely uh, to find their victims, such as Ted Bundy, who used to go like excursions from one state to the other in order to find people and kill them. Uh, and others remained in the same geographic area. For instance, you have uh, Jeff Dahmer, who brought people to his house. You have in the UK, you have Dennis Nielsen, you have Fred and West, Fred West and, uh, and his wife, Rosemary, and you have uh, other people who bring their, their um, um, victims to their own dens. In general, it is, it is uh, less likely, I mean, uh, transient or people, people, serial killers who travel widely are, are uh, not as many as people who are uh, static, people who bring uh, victims to their own areas or to their own houses. Uh, this is because serial killers are, are creatures of habit and they are creatures of habitat. They want to, they are, um, they like that uh, they like to bring people into their own areas so that because they know the area well they have they know where the dumping grounds are they know where to um, snatch people without without being spotted and so on kids are separate and they often escalate over a period of time, sometimes years, and they will continue until the killer is either taken into custody or dies. Some serial killers have never been found. We have a lot of people who, who disappear in the world and we never find them. They could very well have, have been uh, victims of serial killers. We will never know unless we catch them. Uh, so killing tends to be on one-to-one, uh, level. However, there have been some instances where a serial killer has killed more than one person at a time. For example, the bind, torture, and kill killer, BTK, um, has, uh, has killed families, like a whole family uh, at the same time, in the same, in the same event. Uh, there are other serial killers who work together in, in pairs, uh, like uh, Rosemary and Fred West, uh, and, and and other people like Myra Hindley and Ian Brady. So they work, in, as a, they work as a couple in order to commit their crimes. The most important thing from the definition is that serial killers always, always have a cooling off period between murders and their murders are carefully planned. They are not some random, uh, some randomly kind of wrong place, wrong time kind of uh, ram randomness. Serial killers are stalkers. They stalk their victim like predators stalk their, uh, their prey. Um, on, the, on motivation of serial killers, so, I mean, it's very difficult to catch serial killers because if, if, the first thing that that investigators look for is motivation. Why did someone kill someone else? If you if there is no motivation, if the motivation is not apparent, you won't be able to kind of come to you won't be able to think about why somebody killed somebody else. So among the widely debated aspects of serial killing or serial murder are differences in the motives <clears throat> in the motives behind the crimes. Uh, in media outlets, those are the media portray serial killers as mindless killers who possess no real motive. And this is what makes them very, very terrifying. Uh, the police and psychological profilers disagree with the media because they say that serial killers do have a motive, but this motive is not apparent immediately. You need to have more than one kill for you to be able to compare the victims together so that you can know uh, what is motivating them because the motive is usually intrinsic to the person. The motive is very, very personal to, to, the, to the killer. So, so uh, when, when, when profilers or when investigators compare victims together, they will be able to come up with a pattern or a victim trait, and that will lead them to find out or to, to uh, think about the motive 
or the motivation behind the kill. For instance, Ted Bundy's um, uh, uh, murders or Ted Bundy's victims looked alike and they also looked like his girlfriend who, uh, who wanted to leave him or left him eventually. Um, so he was kind of taking revenge, but they wouldn't kill the person who is causing them the problem because this is how they survive. They survive on, on, on uh, the, like they want that person to be alive so that they keep remembering what, uh, if they kill that person, that means that's the end of their, uh, their uh, problems. So they depend on that person emotionally. So therefore they don't kill that person, but they kill people who are similar, who look like them, or somebody who's, uh, whose mother has abused him sexually, for instance. They go and look for someone at the same age when the mother was, was abusing them, who looks the same kind of, uh, who has the same uh, traits and so on. So there is no or very little connection between the perpetrator and the victim. Uh, and this is why it is difficult to find out what motivates them until you have more than two or three kills. Remember in the definition, we said they have, there has to be three murders at least for, the, for something to be considered, for a murder, for a kind of uh, crime to be considered serial crime because they compare the victims. You have to compare the victims to find out about motivation. A little bit on why are they so dif difficult to uh, spot. David Cantor, who is a forensic psychologist and who is an investigative psychologist, he's British, um, he said that serial killers are like invisible abductors and rapists. They are invisible. They are like predators. They it's uh, they they know how to stalk their victims they gain they gain their trust so the invisibility grows out of the killer's focus on their own dens they hide behind a carefully constructed facade of normalcy and they bring their prey back to the world that they have created as much in their heads as in their houses. For instance, Fred West built this image of himself like a family man he was, and also one of the boys in the pub. So he was a, uh, um, uh, everybody in, the, in his community knew him and loved him. They loved him because he was very, uh, a nice guy, a nice, uh, uh, a nice member of the community, but they did. They never knew that he was a, a serial killer, because he constructed this image of himself as a family man. The same thing with his wife Rose West, who who was quite mumsy, and she was uh, supposed to be like uh, the mother figure who is uh, welcoming these students, girl students, female students to her house and taking care of them and, and so on. But she ended up killing uh, some of them. Jeff Dahmer indicated when they caught him, he indicated the importance to him of the inner world that he was creating. When investigators came to Jeff Dahmer's house by accident, uh, they found they found uh, that his his whole there was a whole room that was a shrine to all the people that he killed. You would see they they saw skulls of people. Um, he would he would eat out of the skulls of people. He would eat the people. He was a cannibal, uh, in order to make the people part of himself. He didn't want to uh, to to part with them, so he would eat them so that they are part of his cells, his himself, and then he would keep their body parts, uh, uh, you know, like decorations in his house. He needed to enshrine his fascination with bodies, especially dead bodies. And he brought his victims to his apartment for the early stages of that ritualistic creation. And then he strangled them and then he did, uh, well, he didn't kill them uh, first. Um, well, at the beginning he killed them, but then at, towards the end of his career, his killing career, he thought that he would like the bodies not to be cold when he was uh, committing necrophilia. So when he was having sex with corpses, so he wanted them not to be cold. So he he uh, um, he put acid in. He made, he dug holes in their in their uh, skulls and he put acid in their skulls so that they become they become uh, uh, sex toys for him. Like all developed predators, they stalk their victims, 
by gaining their trust. I mean, a very, very good uh, movie that you can watch is Silence of the Lambs and, and the uh, prequel and the sequels. Uh, so uh, it's uh, especially Silence of the Lambs. It is a combination of the, of, of, of uh, uh, the motivations and, and methods of killing of various serial killers in one. So I don't know if you like this kind of uh, thing as much as I do. Uh, you should check that movie out if you haven't done so yet. Now, uh, why do they kill? In 1985, Brian Masters wrote Dennis Nielsen's biography. Dennis Nielsen was, uh, is, or was uh, a British uh, serial killer who lived in Muswell Hill, and he, he brought uh, people from, uh, from people that he met in bars, men, males. He brought them to his house. Uh, they would spend time together in the house uh, um, at night. They would drink together. But when when the guy, the, the, the guest, told him that, okay, it's time for me to go now, buy whatever, he killed them. He killed them because he couldn't stand the abandonment. He didn't, he, f he felt that when they leave him, it's like abandoning him because he had, he had a trauma in his childhood where his grandfather, who was his father figure, he didn't have a father or he didn't know his father. So his grandfather, who was a father figure, uh, died and he was completely traumatized by that. Uh, he felt abandoned by his uh, loved ones and also by society. So when he grew up and when he eventually managed to kind of do, have these um, 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 uh, relationships, uh, he would bring them, uh, with, they weren't really relationships with live people. So he would bring them home after spending time uh, before they left, he would kill them and he would store them in his under his floorboards. He was working. He had a nine to five job. He was a uh, um, he worked in the job center. So he would go to work, come back at night, take the corpse out of the floor, wash wash him and c clean him and put him on the table with him when he was eating, and he would talk to this he would he would discuss his day with the uh, with the corpse uh, while while he's eating his meal yeah so it was easier for him to uh, to um, communicate with the corpse than with a live human he called um, um, Brian Masters called the book killing for company because he wanted company Dennis Nielsen wanted company but he didn't want the company of live people he wanted the company of dead people now they asked uh, various various kind of types of people with various uh, disciplinary treat uh, training tried to explain why uh, he killed. So why do they kill? Part of the, the this, this applies to most uh, serial killers. Uh, so religious people, pe priests and things, uh, priests and, uh, and uh, you know, anybody who was religious, doesn't have to be a priest, it can be sheikh or something, but in the book it's about um, uh, uh, pre priests. So religious, religious people identified N Nielsen as a messenger from the devil. When they ask psychiatrists, because psychiatrists are doctors, uh, they said that the, uh, psychiatrists are doctors of the mind and the brain. So they said that this, uh, the, 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 the serial killing kind of development uh, was, it could possibly have been because of a pre the pressures of a personality disorder, which was brought on by morbid imagination. Doctors said that there would be, there could be a chemical imbalance in their body. So, so maybe there was an imbalance, they said, between the neurotransmitters and the, and the hormones and the interaction between them. Or they could, it could have been that Dennis Nielsen had uh, inherited a tendency towards madness. Environmentalists and sociologists blamed society. So everyone with different uh, disciplinary training uh, explained Dennis Nielsen's behavior according to their to their discipline and what their discipline has taught them. But when they asked Dennis Nielsen, he said, I don't understand why everybody is making such a big fuss. I probably enjoyed those acts of killing. Poor Dr. Bowden won't be satisfied until he has a reason. Well, enjoying it is as good a reason as any. The answer might lie in the fact that I could just be a bad bastard. So this is a very, very, um, first of all, it's insightful. And second, it's quite scary, this, uh, I could just be a bad bastard, because um, because like if, if we are going to think that 
people can give birth to a person who could just be a bad bastard and end up becoming a serial killer, that is a very terrifying thought. Yeah. However, um, in uh, I mean, um, we have we can we have to explain, of course, serial killing like everything else. We have to explain this theoretically. There could be something genetic in uh, in why people become a serial killer, but of course, it's not a direct relationship. It's if it's not like people inherit the gene to become serial killers, because otherwise, many people in one family would become a serial killer. However, we have we have, for, for instance, Fred West's brother is not a serial killer. Jeff Dahmer's brother is not a serial killer. So, what is it? What is it? Is it biological explanations? Is it psychological explanations? Is it sociological explanations that are important? Or possibly it could be an interplay between all of these, between, between somebody's biological predispositions, which get triggered by environmental or, so, or social factors. So let us examine some of uh, these uh, theories. So I'm going to spend the next four um, slides on explaining what is it that makes a person develop to a serial killer. You have on the right a picture of the brain. It's not a very good picture of the brain because I had to shrink it and elongate it and stuff. So, but why, why I wanted to show this to you is so that you, you, uh, you, you, you notice or you see where the hypothalamus is because I'm gonna talk about this, yeah? So this is the midbrain, the colorful part here is the midbrain and this is the stem and it goes to the spinal cord. Uh, so the hypothalamus, I'm going to talk about it in a minute. So first of all, biological explanations of serial, of how, why somebody becomes a serial killer, two slides. This is the first of two. First of all, you have head trauma. Physical brain trauma has been associated with violent tendencies. Now, um, Head injuries during the formative years or even at birth are one of the most common elements that serial killers have, according to some authors. But there is no empirical evidence on this. However, in the year 2014, so not many years ago, a study by Allerley, uh, found uh, indicated or found that extreme forms of violence may be a result of a highly complex interaction of biological, psychological, and sociological factors, and that potentially a significant proportion of mass or serial killers may have neuropsychological uh, or neurodevelopmental disorders. Now, let's look at neurological factors. Certain brain structures, such as the hypothalamus, um, so such as this, uh, the, blue, the blue bit here, so certain brain structures control certain things in the brain. Hypothalamus, for instance, controls, controls um, uh, uh, things that have to do with violence and, uh, and sexual behavior. So hypothalamic damage may produce violent and destructive behavior, which may result in an individual's inability to separate sexual excitement with violence, especially if this person has been treated as a child, has been, has been sexually abused as a child, and the, the adult who was abusing him sexually, um, you know, corrupted his ideas or his perception that this kind of behavior is a loving behavior. So when they mix uh, love and child abuse or ch sexual abuse together, when they grow up, this is also that the, they bring this with them into their adult life. So the hypothalamus contains the brain center for sexual response and aggression. And if the hypothalamus is damaged, which it could be damaged either uh, after or at birth, or uh, you know, it could be something genetic. If the hypothalamus is damaged, people mix up sexual excitement, can mix up sexual excitement and violence. We have emotional and physiological reaction. During the perpetration of violent acts, including homicide, psychopaths do not manifest the normal emotional responses. So they are not scared. 
I mean, if anybody kind of, uh, if you, even if you watch something uh, that is scary, sometimes your heart will beat very fast, your pupils dilate, you have, uh, you know, you have ex ex abnormally rapid breathing, or sometimes when you are in situations, I'm sure many of you, all of us have experienced this rapid breathing and uh, um, excessive rapid heartbeat, especially if we are scared. Psychopaths don't have this. Now, why don't they have this? Because there is something uh, different that they have in their brain. So the prefrontal cortex, if you look at the prefrontal cortex, uh, so this is the, the part of the brain that is just under your forehead, yeah? So the prefrontal cortex uh, is the control center for aggression. And it is also the, controls, uh, the control center for uh, morality, for conscience, for lo loving, caring, nurturing uh, behavior, and so on. When it is more highly activated, so when it's activated or highly activated, we feel that we are able to control our aggressive impulses because we are going to think about the consequences of our behavior because that part of the brain is highly activated. But MRI scans in, 20, in 2012, again, not so, not so many years ago, uh, Blackwood, uh, who, who is a uh, researcher on these, on, on psychopaths and, uh, on psychopaths and uh, people who have um, antisocial uh, disorder, uh, he found in his MRIs that he did in UCL that the brains of the psychopaths had a shrunken prefrontal cortex. So they didn't have, the prefrontal cortex didn't have the, the volume, the, the, the surface area that people who didn't, who were not psychopaths, they had a bigger surface area of their uh, prefrontal cortex. However, people who were psychopaths had a more shrunken uh, um, prefrontal cortex. So this means that their prefrontal cortex cannot become very highly activated because there isn't enough space for that activation. It's a shrunken uh, prefrontal cortex. This is associated with impaired empathizing with other people. So they have a poor response to fear and distress because the centers that are going to make them more moral and fearful and uh, upset for somebody's uh, problems or empathize with someone, that area is shrunken and it's very small. So, uh, so this is why they lack self-conscious emotions such as guilt and embarrassment. Uh, so this is the, the white bit here, if you can see the picture, the white bit, uh, uh, the top bit is the prefrontal cortex, and this bit here is the amygdala. Uh, so the amygdala is also very important. So we talked about the hypothalamus, we will talk about the amygdala in a minute. Um, so... Uh, what, may, what the role of the, what is the role of aggression in in serial killing uh, now the amygdala is the part of the brain which is responsible for regulating our perceptions of and reactions to fear and aggression the amygdala has connections with other with the, with the rest of the uh, uh, systems in the body that are related to fear. For example, your sympathetic nervous system. Uh, for instance, if you get scared, what happens to your fa facial responses? Um, uh, the, process the processing of smells, the release of neurotransmitters related to stress and aggression. All of these things are regulated by the amygdala. Also, uh, when we experience events that are dangerous, the amygdala stimulates the brain to remember the details of the situation so that we learn to avoid this in the future. Uh, although the amygdala helps us to perceive and respond to danger, and this may lead us to aggress, other parts of the brain serve to control and inhibit our aggressive tendencies. So if one mechanism that helps us to control our negative emotions and aggression is a neural connection, and this neural connection is faulty, then the amygdala and the regions of the prefrontal cortex will not function the same way as with people whose connections are not faulty, okay? Now, there is another uh, point, there's another uh, neurological explanation or biological explanation 
deficits in the um, in the neurotransmitter levels called serotonin. So serotonin is a neurotransmitter which is uh, uh, which is um, uh, uh, which is in the brain and it's responsible for um, the the um, you know it, it is chemicals chemicals of the brain. Yeah. So the deficits in in serotonin levels have been associated with psychopathy, involving excessively aggressive behavior, sometimes genetically and or sometimes because of environmental reasons of stress and uh, and uh, um, you know massive stress or sometimes because of nutrition, uh, famine and hunger and uh, such things. Serotonin doesn't uh, get doesn't get secreted in an optimal way so that you know in an enough way so when serotonin levels are low this can lead to aggressive behavior at the same time i've uh, i've mentioned testosterone here testosterone is not a neurotransmitter actually it's a it's a hormone so when you have low levels of serotonin and you have high levels of testosterone which makes someone aggressive and dominant and low levels of serotonin makes someone excessively aggressive so this is a catalyst for disaster and many people who have uh, who many serial killers who have been uh, captured that it has been demonstrated by, of course, by uh, medical tests and so on, that they have uh, lower levels of serotonin. Naturally, their bodies secrete lower levels of serotonin and higher levels of testosterone. But if you are going to uh, try to understand serial killers just by focusing on their genetic predispositions and their individual biology or character, this tells you only half of the story or less than half of the story. There are other very important things that you should consider. For example, you have psychological reasons for why somebody can develop to become a serial killer. First of all, let's look at childhood factors. Um, many serial killers seem to have problematic or non-existent relationships with their families. Uh, this, their relationships are often strained. Um, possibly they were not taught how to deal with other people because they were neglected children. And these early life attachments translate into a map of how the child will perceive situations outside of the family and in the future. So uh, psychologists have, have uh, looked at, um, you know, how the, the, absence, the absence of a father and how a single mom for example, can struggle to provide adequate ro role model to make, um, you know, she can, she can, it doesn't mean that all single moms uh, provide inadequate role model uh, to, to their male children. It is just that people who have been caught, serial killers who have been captured, have had problems with their uh, 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 you know, family backgrounds. And in these family backgrounds, their mothers were single mothers. So, uh, so some single mothers struggle to provide an adequate male, ro male mo uh, role model for their children. These role models that are bounded by love and by blood, so they're not there and the single mother couldn't provide them. So the developmental acquisition of social cons uh, conscience of compassion for others comes primarily from parenting. First of all, you learn um, compassion and love and, and such things from the mother who loves you or from the care, caregiver, from your primary caregiver that you have who loves and nurtures you. And they teach you what is right, what is wrong, what is good, what is bad, and so on. This is the basis of love and nurturing. If lessons learned from this main social conscience provider are criminal, are hostile, bitter, antagonistic, and selfish, then the young man becomes a greater risk to others, especially if, uh, especially when the offender was sexually abused by parental or authority figure. They learn that it is better to be the person in power doing this self-pleasuring than being a victim. And they may experience uh, they may experience a rather corrupted account of this of the person who is telling them that they are doing this to them because they love them. So they mix up what is uh, what is love, what is uh, you know uh, abuse. 
so ineffective bonding, this can lead to isolation. Ineffective bonding can lead to isolation uh, where the child has been neglected, where the child has been, for instance, uh, Kemper's, uh, Kemper's mother put him in, in, uh, in their basement because she said that he was going to sexually abuse his little sister. So Kemper was 10 years old. His little sister was even younger. And Kemper said in the in future, like when they caught him, he said he had no idea what she was talking about. But she put him in the in the basement of their house, locked him up and treated just they just gave him uh, food. So um, so they could they didn't bond. And when when he was left alone in the basement of the house, this isolation made him think the way it made him have violent fantasies of what he would do when he comes out, how he's going to take revenge on his family who is keeping him in the basement like a like a uh, like a pet, like a dog. <laughs> so so this isolation uh, with intense violent fantasies become the primary source of gratification. So they want to, the only thing that he had in that basement was to, to think about how he's going to take revenge, all the fantasies of how he would kill his mother. Instead of developing positive traits of trust, security, and autonomy, uh, which a child should develop when they have a nurturing uh, a relationship with their mother or with their family, Child development in Kemper's case and in other people's case who have similar experiences, it became dependent on fantasy life and its dominant themes of morbidity, of violence, of killing, rather than routine, self, self, routine uh, healthy social interaction. Uh, finally, I want to look at uh, some sociological uh, explanations. Um, Right. Sociological explanations include things like uh, cultural violence. Um, just quickly, the USA is home for the vast majority of serial killers. So, so we have 68% of total serial killers in the world from 1900 until now, which have been counted. And they are some, something, the figure is around 4,700 and something for uh, nearly 5,000 people. So, uh, 68% of those have come from America. So sociologists said that if 68% of uh, um, serial killers are coming from America, from the USA, it means that it's not so much biological and psychological factors, or it's not so much biological factors that are important, but sociological factors are much more important because otherwise uh, everyone in the world would have had the same uh, uh, number, the same percentage of serial killers. For instance, in India, you have 3.5% um, of the total number of serial killers are from India. In the UK, you have 3%, 3%, uh, 3% uh, sorry, in, in India, I think it's uh, 3%, and in the UK, it's 3.5%. So that is 66 serial killers. Yeah, so um, so... So this means that if it was genetic, everybody would have had the same kind of percentage. But we have a big concentration. So serial kill, uh, the USA is home for the vast majority of serial killers. So sociologists try to explain this by, by sociological factors. Some of these factors I'm going to talk about. So uh, the media, films, News and the internet provide a constant and ceaseless dyad of violence and sex, and the lines between reality are blurred by watching people killed with imp imp impunity. When the young man who is alienated grows up seeing violence as a means to an end, that changes him. And also the USA, uh, so, so there's many, there, there are, you know, I mean, there are more guns in the USA than people. So, and there is also this obsession with using guns in order to solve grievances. So this person who is, who is seeing violence as an, a means to an end becomes a greater risk to others. And uh, especially because he, he, he would own a gun. Uh, compared to 2022 20, other high income nations, the USA gun related murder rate is 25 times higher, although it has only got, um, it's, although its population is, uh, like, uh, 
it has it has 4.5 percent of the world's population, but it is it has 25 percent more uh, uh, murders by the by gun. So the USA has 82 percent of all gun deaths in the world. 92 percent of all women are killed with guns. 91 percent of children. 92% of all young people who are aged between uh, 16 to 24 years old are killed by guns. And between 1968 to 2011, nearly 1.5 million Americans have been killed by guns. So this obsession with the right to bear arms and the irrational fears that underpins it is the major factor in the mentality, in, in the American mentality, and obviously could be a factor in serial killing made easy. So this is one explanation. There's another explanation and uh, that's, uh, um, that's about pornography. So pornography, by the way, is now has been declared in America as an epidemic. It has a series of epidemic uh, 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 you know, it, it's become an epidemic and a public health risk. Yeah. So, so what is with what is with this? Um, now, according to some uh, forensic psychologists, such as Callens, for example, forensic medical psychologists. Uh, Callan says that it's probably the greatest single factor along with child abuse, pervasive pornography is. So when you see other people, he's explaining this. So he says, when you see other people uh, debased as sex objects uh, used solely for personal gratification, men and women subjected to those extreme types of sexual violence and often not seeming to resist it, or indeed they are actively consenting, when sex becomes a cultural form of entertainment to be purchased and promiscuity has lost its social sanction, nobody cares about promiscuity, um, and the young men, uh, the, and young men view women or gay men in a combination of contempt, resentment, anger, uh, and they are unsuccessful with finding their own personal relationships themselves, they can become significantly greater risk of violence towards women, especially if they are able to pejoratively objectify women as targets. But this doesn't mean that everybody who watches pornography is going to become like this. This is a special situation where, where uh, people who are watching this are developing contempt and promiscuity, uh, I'm sorry, contempt and resentment and anger. And at the same time, they cannot find their own um, sexual partner. So, and they start seeing people as uh, flattened out objects on whom they can perform their fantasies. There's another very important point why in the USA we have, uh, or they have 68% of the total number of serial killers in the world. It's because there is a whole culture around, around, <coughs> around sorry, around celebrity status of of uh, uh, serial killers. In the USA, the high level of serial killing is a malign product of gun-obsessed, violent pornography addicted, socially fractured subculture with huge investment in sexual violence as business and where serial killers become celebrities who get marriage offers. Uh, there are people who, ha who buy, for instance, John Wayne Gacy's um, uh, clown clown paintings because John John Wayne Gacy used to to dress up as a clown when he was when he would uh, kill the young boys who he that he brought to his den in order to rape and kill so he would be dressed up as a clown and he has lots of he painted lots of clown pictures so many people pay so much money to buy these things they are paraphernalia related to serial killers so it's a celebrity status we we still hear about charles charles manson everybody talk, knows about charles manson uh, so um, Ted Bundy, uh, instead of seeing the the you know the dangerous of the dangerousness of Ted Bundy, people focus on his handsomeness 
and so on. Uh, so there is a celebrity status and serial killers get offers in while they are in prison, they get marriage offers. So the, all of these sociological explanations also have a very, very important impact. So in conclusion, uh, one theoretical perspective is not sufficient to explain the phenomenon of serial murder. You have brain damage, brain disorders, brain chemicals, hormones, neurotransmitters, family history. All of these certainly seem to create problems in a person. However, one has to question why the characteristics of serial killers and psychopaths always involves child, involve childhood horrors of abuse and neglect. So you have sociological factors. If a psychopathic serial killer is born, then why do they share sociological um, experiences and psychological experiences? Circumstances that promote extreme violence are the combination of a history of extraordinary early ongoing abuse, some kind of brain dysfunction, and psychopathic behavior cannot be linked to one source. Serial killers and psychopaths are very complicated individuals. And I want to end with Ramsland, uh, Ramsland's quote, the biggest lesson that we have learned from brain research is that violence is the result of a developmental process, a lifelong interaction between the brain and the environment. So this means that our brains can change based on the environment that we are experiencing. If we live in happy, loving, nurturing environments, we will be more balanced people. And if we live in, a, in an environment where we are constantly scared and traumatized, we will become anxious, we will become imbalanced, we will become, uh, um, uh, you know, we will have a difficult kind of uh, transition into adulthood. So this is a little bit of a taster, and I will be happy to take any questions if you have them. I hope you enjoyed it. Wow, Lucia, that was um, certainly very um, topical, and um, I can't find words now. I'm just um, so overwhelmed by it all. What an absolutely, absolutely fascinating um, lecture there, mini lecture on serial killers. Um, we those attendees aren't shocked to the core um, with all of that but that is a taste of what you can expect if you join the cpsj program um, for those of you who are um, who need some support and guidance after this session do get in touch with us if we if you want to talk through some of these topics um, lucia thank you so much for that contribution. i can't see any questions in that is there any questions i can't see any questions in the q and a on the chat okay. um, but most certainly was was very very interesting and um what's the word i'm looking for thought provoking certainly and just how the minds how how one's brain can be developed through a series of you know interactions from your childhood and the the whole developmental stages from childhood and how that changes um fascinating absolutely fascinating Thank you so much for that today. Thank you to our lovely panel of students who were here today. Um, and again, do get in touch with us if you want to know anything a bit more about the, this fascinating program, CPSJ. Um, thank you, everybody, and we will leave it there for today. Thank you.